Good morning. I'm Greg Watson. And this morning, we're going to talk about quality by any other name. You know, we're being faced with a very interesting situation in the quality community because right now this evolution of quality is becoming digitized. And what I want us to do today is to consider how we have evolved to the point where we are and to help us understand what's going to come next. At the end of approximately 45 minutes, we're going to have time for some Q&A. So please queue up those questions and hold them, and then we will have the moderator come back and help us work our way through any questions that this presentation may raise. So we have three learning objectives today. First, I want to help you discover how 1987 became a breakthrough year in the evolution of modern quality. Lots of things change happened in that year. And we have to understand that, that this created both chaos and opportunity for the future. Then I want us to understand how have leading companies influenced quality development over these past few decades. And finally, we want to learn how a customer approach and enabling technology advanced quality thinking into quality 4.0 and how it will carry us beyond this particular discovery that we are now going through. So first, quality by other names. We've seen it called quality control, quality management, quality assurance, Six Sigma just in time, total quality control, maybe quality standards, lean, business excellence, lean Six Sigma, total quality management, and maybe just plain excellence. So all of these are names that apply to the same sort of principles, which we think of in general as quality. So what do we mean by quality by any other name? What are the core ideas and concepts that we need to carry forward into the future as we shed off, if you will, some of the encumbrances we've had of old methodologies and old ideas that no longer carry forward into the digital age and beyond? So, is quality a fad? Is quality a fantasy? Or is quality a fact? We have many people thinking many of these different things. We talk about the quality method of the day, and that means it's a fad. You know, we talk about quality. We can never actually get there, and so then it becomes a fantasy. Or we can have an evidence-based approach towards understanding how well we've progressed, how far we have to go, and what we have to do to make the next level of improvement happen. So what is quality to you? So let's review some recent history. So this basically enlightenment period began in 1980 with the NBC white paper by Dr. W. Edwards Deming. If Japan can, why can't we? Now we have to remember the situation in 1980. At that point in time, the Japanese industry was overcoming American industry in many different disciplines. So they had overcome already in memory chips. They were overcoming in other semiconductor chips, such as microprocessors. And there was a big concern that they would take over many parts of, of American industry. The Japanese automotive industry was making a very big challenge to the American big three. And so what we saw in 1980 was a catalyst for executive attention. And it came from asking this basic question. If Japan is able to make this change happen, why can't America do it? And what we saw was that there was a couple of situations. One, workers were not responsible for poor quality. There was also a lack of continual improvement. We weren't treating improvement systematically in America. And Deming made this comment. He observed that, I think that people here in America expect miracles. American management thinks they can just copy from Japan, but they don't know what to copy. He said, you have to understand the theory of what you want to do before you just do things. Otherwise, you're just going do, 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 and you don't think and engage your mind. How should the system work? How should people collaborate together cross-functionally and organizationally to improve their overall effort and achieve success as judge in the marketplace? Well, what we see is we talk today about quality 4.0, but in reality, what you could call quality 3.0 is the foundation. And there's two things. Quality 3.0 really began with Walter Schuhart. And Schuhart introduced this idea of quality control through statistical methods. So he was saying we can sample the output of processes to understand how good that process is likely to work as a probability in the future. And basically, instead of inspecting the quality of every individual item, we can get a very general 
confidence about what quality is being produced as a whole. He uh, introduces ideas of cycles of improvement to relate to design and production of deliverables that are delivered to customers in response to some sort of specification that's agreed upon. Now, we see that there might be an intermediate part before we get to quality 4.0, and it was Dr. Noriaki Kano. And what Dr. Kano gave us was what I consider the second most important quality discovery in the last decade. And that was, it was his theory of attractive quality. And what he did was he engaged this concept of understanding the mind of the consumer. And he says that attractive quality really it engages the needs in this product development equation. So we think about what is it the customer needs, they must have, what is it that we have to do to beat or equal the competition? So that's this head-to-head -head or one-dimensional quality. And what do we need to do to have really attractive quality? To get the customer's attention so they say, oh, you have a hot product or you have a killer app. So this reinforced the need for executive actions to deliver quality business results. Because Kano said that the executive has to be engaged in that process to be able to make those types of decisions happen. They're not just operational decisions about daily management systems. There are executive decisions about strategic uh, direction of an organization. How will it create itself for the future? Now, there was time for a breakthrough. Kano came out in 1984. Deming's paper, uh, a white paper was in 1980. And what we started seeing was there was a big growing up need for change. People were not liking it. In 1983, the Reagan administration canceled the Mill Standard 9858. Now, that was a very important historical event because what they did was that was the standard that was being used for quality in all Department of Defense, NASA, FAA, and other government contracts. So now there's a clause in the contracts that says you have to have quality, but there's no standard for judging it. And that created a large problem in the acquisition community of the U.S. government. And so they started pushing for the need for a standard. And out of this arose the only standard that was left standing at that time was BS 5750. And so that drove the need, and it was actually pushed for by American defense and aerospace industry. And the ASQ Aerospace Division was one of the key proponents of this, of the need for a global standard that could be used for contract administration. How do we go check to find out this company is actually uh, providing the type of quality systems that we need to ensure they can follow through with the specifications that we've agreed upon? Well, this is why 1987 became a vintage year, if you will, for quality. So just like we speak of wines as having a very good vintage, the grapes were perfect, you know, just the right taste and everything, the right amount of water, the right amount of sunshine, and, and the proper things, and that wine becomes a classic, okay? So I happen to like red wine, so I, I like to fi find a vintage red wine, uh, a Malbec or a Cabernet Sauvignon, for instance. But you know, for quality as professionals, we see 1987 as a vintage year because so much happened. So that was the year that 1987, what ISO 9000 was introduced. So ISO 9000 1987 came out. And that satisfied the need of industry to have this standard for contract administration purposes. The next thing we saw was that that was also the year that the Malcolm Baldrige National Quality Award was introduced. And we started seeing here a group of quality professionals, about 120 to 130 quality executives got together and agreed on these are general criteria for what makes an acceptable or excellent quality organization. It doesn't make the best, okay, because it's not a benchmark. It's not applied to a particular industry. It's what they could agree on by consensus across a wide variety of industries as generic direction for how you improve a system. So it's an aspirational view of quality compared to ISO 9000, which was a basic minimalist view of quality. We also saw then that Motorola doubled up on this and they announced Six Sigma. Now Six Sigma is actually specified. At that point in time, Motorola had four steps. They had measure, analyze, improve, control. They had sets of quality tools that they applied to each of those. By the time this matured in the mid-90s, it became DMAIC, with define added in, which was the executive input on choosing a project. 
And that's what had been happening in the 1970s and 80s with what was called continual or uh, quality improvement teams. So quality improvement teams were dedicated by management. They said, here is a charter. Here's what you need to go to. Here's the problem that we need to attack. Please go out and take a look at it. And then as a team, figure out what's the recommendation for management. Well, that's the same structure that's around the mental structure of the DMAIC model. And so Motorola not only announced it, but they said to all their suppliers, you have to use it. Now, we'll talk a little bit less about Six Sigma at this point in time, but we do want to say that was a major change. And now Motorola in 1987 had not achieved Six Sigma, but they announced that that was the organizational goal. 1991, George Fisher, the CEO of Motorola, wrote a letter saying, we have achieved 5.3 Sigma as a company, and we have saved 2.1 billion US dollars in doing so, and we're declaring victory. Okay, so that was the third thing that happened in 1987. The fourth thing that happened was the Profit Impact of Market Strategy, or the PIM study, was released in a book by Bradley Gale and Robert Bozell. And what this did was it documented a study that was funded originally by General Electric in 1983. There's a number of companies that were working together with GE as collaborators in a cross-industry consortium of the chief quality officers where they were actually taking a look at in all of their units what compares head-to-head -head, a quality organization versus a competitor who has not embraced quality. And what they were doing was analyzing three dimensions. One dimension was the dimension of perceived customer satisfaction. The second dimension was market share penetration of products. And the third dimension was the return on investment for R&D projects. And what they documented in there, and particularly in chapter six of that study, the profit impact of market strategy, they recognized that quality was the king. That when you had high perceived customer satisfaction with a product, you had a high market share, then you maximized return on investment. That caught the attention of executives. Why? Because they need to have some sort of understanding that the actions they take will drive the continual improvement of profitability in their company because their customer is the stock analyst, the shareholder, the major investment institutions that are coming and saying, can you give us some concept, some probability of how well you will continue to deliver this level of performance in the future for our financial estimates? Because we have financial objectives, we have to give to our objectives, our, our investors. And will you actually be able to comply with those expectations that our investors are laying on us for growth or solidity of dividends? The, fourth, the fifth thing we see happening that year was Florida Power and Light. Now, they challenged the uh, Japanese Deming Prize, the Deming Application Medal, as a company. And for a number of years, they had been working on this. In 1987, they had the Deming Challenge. So Dr. Kano, Dr. Kume, and, and Dr. Makabe and others came from Japan to do the investigation, and they declared that Florida Power and Light was actually achieving that level of quality. And this had been something that actually it solidified the global quality community in America because over 20 companies actually decided we're going to help Florida Power and Light. This is a matter of, if you will, national pride that if Japan can, why can't we? Well, Japan can, why can't we get a Deming Prize? And so many of the companies, Hewlett Packard, Florida Power and Light, um, and, and many of the people that I know in quality actually gathered in and helped them to be able to build that system so that they could actually respond and become this first non-Japanese company to achieve that high level of performance. Finally, the last thing that happened was the Japanese had been doing much work on quality since 1948. 1948, the Japanese Union of Scientists and Engineers established a QC research committee. It was headed up by Shigeru Mizuno. And many of the well-known names of, of uh, Japanese consultants were on that committee, notably Karu Ishikawa. And what we see is that over the next 10 years, they were actually struggling to see how do we put quality into a system? How do we adapt this into the ways of working that fit for a Japanese culture? And they came up with a unique Japanese approach. And they called it total quality control. Now that term actually was invented 
by Armand Feigenbaum when he published a 1954 article in Harvard Business Review. And they took that term, but not the meaning of it, and applied it in the context. So it was a Japanese style, what they call Nihon Teke, Japanese style, total quality control system. And when they were having the lectures from, for instance, Dr. Deming or Dr. Duran, they had this committee serve as the note takers. And Mizuno was then asked to solidify those note takers into what are the major takeaways? And one of the takeaways was Deming had a six step approach, which he based on the three step Schuhart cycle. And then the question was, how do we take this approach to continual improvement and actually make it our own? Now in Japan, they had a program before that that came out of a group called the Efficiency Society, established in 1912 to bring the work of Frederick Winslow Taylor, his principles of scientific management, into the Japanese context. Now Taylor they viewed in terms of the historical perspective of Adam Smith. So Adam Smith had written The Wealth of Nations in uh, 1787 or 77, and he was writing basically about the division of labor between management and workers, or you would say the planners and the doers. And then Taylor came along and said, there's a third category, it's the inspectors. And so when Schuhart created his three-step process, he said it was specification, experimentation, and, and then um, uh, in, uh, inspection, specification, and, and experimentation. And so all of those three became plan, do, see. See with your eyeball, not see with a letter C. And so that was a process that was embedded already in Japanese society. And so what Mizuno did was he said, well, the C is actually check. And check means check what we have done against our standard work. Check what we have done against the specification. Check what we have done against our history. Evaluate and say, are we actually complying with those things we know we should be doing in the process for standard daily management work? And if it's not, then we have to act. And this was the, the, the phase that they were adding because that's what Deming had added was this concept of experiment and adjust it and then turn it around as you turn the cycle. And that's where the PDCA cycle came from in 1959. Thank you, Dr. Kano, for explaining that history in Japan. And so we started seeing that things were coming out of Japan, but they were not canonized in English. All of the Japanese writings were done in Japanese. And what happened in the early 1980s is Dr. Kuro Ishikawa, who was the, one of the grandfathers of quality movement in Japan, along with Mizuno and Tatsuki Yatsaka, they said, we have to get this into a broader language and explain to the world, what do we mean by what uh, Ishikawa's book said, TQM or TQC, the Japanese way. So what is it we do that's different than what is explained in Western literature? And so there were a series of books and studies published by research committees of the JUICE QC Research Committee, the Japanese Standards Association, and others. And also they published those books in Japanese and had them translated into English. And over the next three years, they were released as translations into English for the first time we could see inside what those companies were doing. Also, we had a series of books published by Taiichi Ono, to explain what he had been doing as the VP in charge of manufacturing operations at Toyota Motor Company. Shigeo Shingo published books from his perspective on what he had done, not at the, the, the level of the high level of Taiichi Ono for the whole Toyota, uh, Toyota production system, but at the working level and zero QC and the concept of SMED. And so we start seeing that those methodologies all came out in 1987. And insightful leaders took advantage of this. They started seeing, we have to have some different company-wide priorities. We have to have customer focus. We have to have continual improvement. And they started learning from Japanese examples. Now, there were American subsidiaries in Japan who acted as coach mentors. And many of the leading companies in the quality movement in the 80s in America had subsidiaries in Japan. So, Hewlett Packard had uh, Yokogawa Hewlett Packard, which won the Deming Prize in 1981. Xerox had Fuji Xerox, which had also been a Deming Prize winner. Florida Power and Light learned directly. Ford learned directly from the Japanese as it has taken over Mazda as a 20% owner. And there were others. And so we started seeing this intellectual migration coming into the U.S. and then being adapted to American-style management. 
And not least of all was the uh, Toyota General Motors New United Motors plant that was built in Fremont, California, where there was a blending of Japanese uh, total productive system with the American way of production through the United Auto Workers Union. So that is not actually truly the TPS system. It's a blended and adapted system to the U.S. culture or what could be made to work in a U.S. environment. So at this point in time, what I'd like to do is consider a few case studies. And so let's think about these. And there are five case studies that came about what I call these quality 3.5 cycles of discovery. And some of these companies were successful role models, some several times. So Xerox between 1975 and 1983 is going to be beginning that journey. And we'll talk about each of these in, in progression. Hewlett Packard from 1981 to 1982. Compaq Computer from 1982 to 1995. Xerox again from 1992 to 2002. Nokia Mobile Phones from 1991 to 2002, and Toshiba Corporation from 1995 to 2003. Now, these all have a couple of things in common. One is they have about a 10-year period of time where they were able to drive excellence in the company. Now, companies do not necessarily maintain excellence forever once they do this. And that is the challenge of executive functions to deliver strategic quality through the purposeful intent of having excellence as a long-term enduring capability of the company. So I struggled with each of those words very distinctly to make sure that that was talked about. So it's there, the executive's intent to pursue long-term excellence throughout this company so it endures. The second thing is I have personal knowledge of each of those companies because I worked with them in those periods in different ways. And so I'll talk about Xerox Corporation first. So in this first period, Xerox was developing what they called leadership through quality. This had four basic components to it. So one was what they called competitive benchmarking. They learned about that from Yoko Gawa Hewlett Packard. That gave them their wake up call. So from 1975, basically to about 1980, they had had a decline in return on net assets from 19.8% to 3% in just four years. Now, this was a result of a, uh, a legal battle in, in the United States where Xerox was sued by IBM and Kodak, and, and they were said you know, that they were actually monopolizing this large copy graphics uh, business. And so Xerox was found actually in, in violation of the law, anti-trade and monopolistic practices. And they were then forced, if you will, to open all of their patent history and make the patents generally available, some 2,500 patents. And because they were considered a predatory pricer, they were actually forced to train anybody in how to apply those patents to remake products like printers and copying machines. And so what happened was IBM, Kodak, didn't come and ask. They wanted to develop their own, uh, if you will, a favored position through their own copyrights, their own approaches, their own patents, if you will. So they wanted to have their own barriers. However, the Japanese did come. Companies like Konica, Ricoh, Savin from France. And so what they did was they came and started taking a look at what was happening. So Xerox had employed competitive benchmarking. They, they, they saw that at 1980 that they had actually had manufacturing costs which were the same as the sales price of Japanese printers in Japan. So that, how can you compete if you manufacture it at the same price somebody else is selling it? Clearly you are far behind. They also had a continual improvement process. They had a problem solving process and they had an employee involvement process. So those were the fundamentals of leadership through quality. And what they saw as they implemented this was that there was a dramatic turnaround by embracing quality. So in the next eight years after this decline, they saw the return on those assets came back up to 14%. And this is why they were able to win the Baldrige Award, because they actually had the performance that matched their strategy. The second company I want to talk about is Hewlett Packard. And, and HP was looking at how do we manage the HP way? Their conversion point came as they had a new CEO, John Young. He was replacing the originators of the company. So the founders were Bill Hewlett and Dave Packard, who started the company basically in 1939. 
And they had established their way of working called the HP way, which they documented in 1957, and HP was continuing to use that way. Now what happened in, in coming on board, John Young realized that he's following two Zions of, of, if you will, Silicon Valley. These were the people who founded it in a garage. They were worshiped, if you will, by the other people in Silicon Valley as the role model for how you become high tech and how you operate in that particular world. And so the question he had was, what do I do? And the answer was he doubled down on quality. Quality and continual improvement had always been emphasized in uh, Hewlett Packard. Reliability engineering was basically created out of Hewlett Packard. And so if we start seeing those branches started doing things that were very, very important in the electronics industry. Now, what he did was he said, we have to challenge ourselves to get better. He came on board in 1979. In 1980, he declared what he called the 10X challenge. The 10X challenge was that every business unit within Hewlett Packard had to reduce their defect rates in the field by tenfold over the decade of the 1980s. Now, for some organizations, that was pretty easy, but some, it was very hard. At that point in time, in 1980, HP had a computer out there called the HP 150. It had a touchscreen display, very advanced technologically, but its field failure rate was only 4%. At the same time, the IBM desktop had a 20% field failure rate. So for IBM to make that improvement, they would only have to go down to a 2%. But for HP to make that improvement, they would have to go down to a 0.4% field failure rate. And that was really pushing the level of technology available because HP was already leading, if you will, in field quality. So, so what does HP do? So they embraced a strategy in that period of time. How do we go about this? Fortunate for them, they had the model of Yokogawa Hewlett Packard who won the Deming Prize in 1981. Now that was actually a very a, a substantial role model for the company because what that uh, organization had done was they were a blending of Yokogawa Electric Works and Hewlett Packard in Japan. And when they were blended together, they were actually the least profitable business unit of over 50 in HP. But by 1981, they had become the most profitable. And John Young looked at that and he says, why can't we do what they're doing? If Japan can, why can't we? So remember, that video came out in 1980. The question was lingering. And so he challenged the rest of Hewlett Packard to learn from them to find out what is this total quality control? What is this just-in-time manufacturing? And that 10X challenge then coalesced the minds of the executives that they have to move forward. Now, nothing happened for a couple years. Why? Because the executives didn't know what to do, and so they just went along fat, dumb, and happy, if you will, and the next thing they know is nothing happened. So then John Young did a very important thing. He changed the, uh, the, the, the benefit package for all executives, so their additional compensation, bonuses, if you will, was all dependent on how they improved their business units to the 10X challenge. So after three years, it started moving. By 1985, there was enough movement that the people at Motorola saw, hey, HP's winning and they're beating us. What do we do about it? And that was the famous meeting where one of the Motorola execs said, our quality sucks. And Bob Galvin says, if Hewlett Packard can do 10X in 10 years, we can do 10 times 10X in five years. And that spawned the Six Sigma metric, the motivation behind it. But HP also had a best R&D time to market scheduling study. And what they realized is it's not just about having quality, it's also about getting the right product to the market at the right time. And now in the same time, they're participating in the cross industry study with General Electric that then created the PIM study they're also engaged in developing standard work and creating the ISO 9000-1987 approach through the US uh, uh, tag. And then they were also embedded in this uh, program to understand what is this criteria set that's what was called the Malcolm Baldrige National Quality Award. And they created the HP Quality Maturity System. They brought on board Hoshin Conry. They brought on board Competitive Intelligence. They also brought on board uh, this, this uh, Concept, uh, concept of, of uh, uh, strategic planning. How do we actually make this deployed into the organization through connectivity? So all of these changes were happening about. And so their, their system was based on an example internally, and, and that challenge gave them a visibility that if they can do it, we can do it too.
and that then went to the rest of the company. Compact Compa Computer was founded in, in early uh, 1980s, and, and it actually had a cultural foundation that was supported by statistics. So when the three founders of that company, Bill Murtaugh, Rod Canyon, and, and Jim Harris came together, they were reacting against their prior experience. And they said, we know what type of company we want to work for. It's a company that puts the customer first. It manages by fact. It works on common sense. It uses consensus decision making and it's focused on achievement. So it was an action orientation company that is using a sense of urgency. And today we think of that as the Silicon Valley mindset. And so they actually drove very rapid business results. They had the best first year sales record of any American industry ever. They were the fastest company to make it to the Fortune 500. But what happened in 1992 was they had a crisis, and the crisis was this. The business model was all focused on distribution through dealer channels. And what happened in 1992 was the dealer channels were being squeezed because one of the other competitors says, we're not going to follow that model. Dell said, we're going to sell direct. And what happened was that they could actually cut out levels of cost. And so Dell is selling direct cheaper and gaining market share. And so what Compaq saw was our, our dealer channel went from 10 to 5 in just a two-week period of time. That created an inventory crisis in the sales channel, and that meant reduced sales out the, outbound from Compaq. And so then what happened? Compaq had to change. How did they change? They used a concept I call strategic benchmarking. They did four studies and say, what do we need to actually do to turn around this business? So one thing they had to do was they had to learn how to talk with customers. They had never actually talked with customers before. And so we had to figure out how do we do that? What's going to be our process for doing it? How do we get customer orders? How do we guide them on technology? Another thing they had to do was produce in lot size of one. So if you're going to take orders individually from customers, you have to be able to produce individually. And while Compaq actually had a streamlined material flow and production process, they were building in lot sizes of maybe a thousand. So it's a very different type of production scheme. They also had to take a look at their products. And so the products had to become much cheaper in terms of being built because it was no longer that the dealers would make money on servicing and, and so forth because the dealers actually needed to make money off the selling of the products. So at the, the old business model, Compaq made the money from the sales, the dealers made it from uh, selling the insurance and the, the installation, the setup charges, and any sort of training that goes along with it. And so these were ingredients that, that Compaq had to move forward in terms of creating that new process for the future. And so they not only you know, had became this, they were also able to turn the business around in just two years. So they went from, they had expected over $4 billion in sales in 1993, they got 3.6. But by 1994, they had doubled to $7.2 billion in sales and returned, if you will, to that leading position in the computer industry. The next case study is return to Xerox again. And this is leadership through quality phase two. And so now I was actually a vice president of quality at Xerox. And so they, over the decade of the 80s, had created this system called Hoshin Connery, or what Xerox called Managing for Results. By 1995, it was in place. They also created what they called a business excellence model. They didn't like the Baldridge, just like HP didn't. HP had its quality maturity program. At uh, Xerox, they had their business excellence model. As a matter of fact, they had that term, and when Rank Xerox won the European Quality Award, business excellence was put into the limelight, and now many people started using that language and then the derivation of that operations excellence to follow. And so they also created process ownership and delegation of authority into their system and letting the workers have more decision rights. They engaged in Lean Six Sigma methodology. And one of the more important things was they were experimenting with the quality function, how it's managed. And towards the end of the decade, uh, by around or middle of the decade, they had integrated the quality, human resources, and IT functions under one person, Hector Matroni, and he became the chief administrative officer for, for the, the whole company, embedding all of those integrated components of an advanced quality system. They created a lot of business results in that period. So they had a product line transition uh, from analog to digital technologies, changing the whole product line of the company in just a two-year period of time. 
they added capability for document management and multifunctionality to machines. And that then created a new surge for Xerox during that period. Another company that came along was Nokia Mobile Phones. Now, Nokia developed, if you will, uh, out of uh, multi-different industries. They had uh, originally paper, uh, limb, uh, uh, timber industries, cutting down trees, selling trees, pulp products. They developed a rubber industry, making boots, cables for, for uh, telecommunications cables, and so forth. And then they had one small business that was doing radio systems for government. And out of that, they created a, a company that was actually working on digitized telecommunications technology called NMT. By 1991, they were introducing the uh, GSM products in mobile phones. They were bulky types of products, but they were actually considered to be leading edge, and they were one of the three leaders in mobile telephony by 1992. And so they were then developing their new product, uh, which is called the 2110. That took three years for them to develop that product. And they were then trying to understand, how do we actually build this business? So in 1994, I became a consultant. At that time, there were only 5,000 employees in Nokia mobile phones, and it was only a small part of Nokia Corporation. Over the next five years, it became the largest component of Nokia uh, Corporation. And ultimately, it, it became divested the only part of Nokia until uh, uh, they remerged, if you will, the Siemens component that had been spun off into a joint venture. But the development of the Nokia Way was critical. So what was the Nokia Way? Well, it was modeled after HP. So it was a process-oriented management system that created what they called a self-regulated management process. So employees could manage themselves. It used a current state analysis for strategic input. So management had to go and address certain questions in the pre-strategy planning sessions and do a face-to-face -face evaluation with how well were they doing. And then they had a Hoshin-based strategic planning process that says, how will we consolidate this into what we need to do collectively as an organization? They used an integrated competitive intelligence system to understand how are they moving in the markets. And they discovered that it's no longer just uh, the, the competitors are coming from Motorola or Ericsson. We also have Sony or Samsung and these others emerging around the world. And then Lean Six Sigma was applied to production and R&D. All of that was happening in the decade of the 90s. And what we saw in the period between 1994 and 1999, the compound annual growth rate in shipments was 86% over those five-year period of times. They then beat, if you will, the compact record as the fastest growing technology firm in the world. Now I come back to Toshiba Corporation. After leaving HP, I was involved in Toshiba in a program for their CEO at the time, Taizo Nishimura, and it was called Management Innovation 2001. And this is a CEO-driven, urgent transformation project. And he saw that there is structural change we need to this organization. It was a very Japanese company. The accounting systems were archaic, their HR systems were traditional, and he wanted to change it all. And he was choosing the Lean Six Sigma toolkit as a toolkit to operationalize and standardize continual improvement throughout the organization. Now, they had been doing TQM. They had been very inventive and, and active in that. And he was using this as a way to create, uh, if you will, very ex um, capable problem solvers to work in the organization. And he had information technology as the core enabler. And so he decided to do this, and he said, I am retiring on the 1st of April in 2001. So the innovation is we will change the management system in the next 18 months. And over that period of time, they accomplished completed projects, 7,700 Lean Six Sigma projects. They documented through their accounting system 1.8 billion savings, which was reported to the press in the Nikkei uh, business press. And they had trained 1,800 people as black belts. They had also chained, trained 60 people who they called the top runners. These were people who met certain criteria with undergraduate engineering and graduate degrees in, in business or, or engineering. And it actually worked in English-speaking countries and had command of the English-speaking language. And they uh, brought them up through a system of black belts doing projects and then coaching others, becoming master black belts, and then leading the organization. Those people became presidents of different parts of the, the company and also a member of the board of directors.
And so we saw Toshiba was also turning itself around. Now, as we come to this, we can reflect on some lessons learned. Not one of those companies, can you say, kept that standard of quality over a much longer period of time than the periods I'm talking about. And so what they did in that period of time, though, is instructive for us to understand what we can do in our companies to make change happen. So there are some lessons learned, and there are some common critical success factors. So first, they combined a systems approach to quality. So they combined management and operations quality improvement methods. They also evolved technology, and they applied the technology of the day to what they were doing. They engaged their employees, so there was an active leadership initiative that the people saw management is behind this and they're participating. It was always customer focused, and there was always strong employee participation. And there was always a structured scientific basis for making improvements happen. So in this, we see there are some enablers for success. I identified five. So these were common uh, success threats among these uh, quality leaders at that time. So one, they had engaged and committed business leaders. So the executive in charge did indeed have an unflagging purpose for effecting continual improvement in all areas of the company. All employees were engaged. There were no handouts. Nobody could say, I'm an exception. It doesn't apply to me. There was a total systems approach to quality. So quality was embedded in every aspect of the company. They had, again, a structured improvement method that they applied universally throughout the company. So it wasn't saying you can have one here, you can have one there, you can vote on what it is. We're all going to use the same method and we're all going to make it part of our cultural way of working. And the fifth was they accepted technological innovations as a part of their pathway moving forward. So what do we see in terms of leadership commitment? First, it was the, lead of the, the role of the leader. So they had to create a vision of the future and lead people for, towards that through persuasive communication. They also had to set a role model for cultural behavior and an application of a continual improvement spirit. So it's not something you give up, it always keeps pressing forward. And the results of that leadership was organization-wide acceptance of the need to pursue continual improvement, and also a willingness to expose process lags, waste, and inefficiencies that led to financial loss. Second, we saw this all-employee engagement. So the role of the employees was they were committed to the framework, to teamwork, self-managed regulation of their own work according to standards. They actively engaged to do individual continual improvement activities as well as team projects. The results of this engagement was that there was control of standardized work in their own work areas. They also contributed to the improvement of the flow and quality in adjacent areas, and that built the system's strength in the organization. The total systems approach. We saw Deming's principle in his system of profound knowledge was appreciation for a business system. And what we saw was that they developed an understanding of end-to-end -end connections in work and business processes. They had an ability to understand external influences on the performance of their own process activities. And the benefits of this approach was that there was a causal systems and they became much more transparent. They could see the causes, they could actually assign the cause to something they did when they saw special variation that was not natural happening in the process. They also had a potential for solutions of multi-causal issues and the ability to stream work uh, in value streams because they can now see more transparently what was happening in other parts of the organization and not just have blinders that restricted them to only seeing their own part. The fourth enabler was structured improvement. And here we see they were taking a scientific approach to improvement. In Japan, we take a look at many of the leading companies and they call PDCA as a scientific approach to improvement. And actually there's more than that. So there is standardized due check act, daily management, but the change system in the business is PDCA directed. But there's also a transformation process about management, about how do we apply resources to drive organizations over a long-term change and accept those major investments that drive us forward. So the organization basically though, creates a single methodology for standard work process documentation and improvement that gives them this base. They have a management by fact data-based decisions so or evidence-based decision, and they use evidence, uh, objective evidence to assure objectivity in how decisions are made. 
And the benefits of this structured scientific process was that these organizations could more uh, rapidly understand if an issue is important and what needs to be pursued urgently. Standard methods and tools also allow the teams to communicate effectively and efficiently across their various barriers of performance. Finally, technological innovation. And here we see disruptive technology creates opportunity. So digital technology enables improved metrics. So artificial intelligence, machine learning, robotics process automation, all enable adaptive process learning. And many people don't realize it, but the very beginning of the Toyota production system happened in 1971. Why? Because of technology. At that point in time, Toyota implemented point of sales terminals in their dealers. And now they had visibility to the pull signal. So they could align their Kanban processes, which they already had, to the pull si signal and synchronize the performance of the business. So the computer system was actually the enabler of everything we see about just in time and what people call lean. That's where the pull system came from. And one of the, the problems I have with lean thinking today is we have to understand how it becomes technologically engaged through the intermingling of physical processes and information flow technology. So we're gonna see more of this happen as we start seeing these advanced capabilities come about. And there are some results of this technological leadership. So first we see it eliminates the de delay between uh, detecting a bad process result and correcting it. It also permits a system-wide perspective of the way that total workflows deliver value or how they lose value or where they require improvement. And so what does the future hold? We've seen where it came from. We saw the lessons that were learned out of that history. And so how do we focus on quality for the future? So we need to have a dedicated purpose of quality. And what I think is that many times we've gotten so enmeshed in the, the various definitions of quality held by various, quote, gurus of the past that we've started arguing against each other about the wrong things. In an article in 1993, uh, David Garvin talked about what he called transcendental quality. And that is the philosophical definition of quality that actually grew out of Aristotle's initial definitions from the Nicomalian ethics in about 8, 380 BC. And, and there, Aristotle distinguished between good and bad. And so when I came about thinking about this, I thought, you know, one thing for a transcendental definition, it's gotta do two things. It has to have this persistent pursuit of goodness. We're always looking to do things better and right. But we need to couple that tightly with also the relentless avoidance of badness. And that's talk about the reliability function. Things have to not just work when the customer gets them, but they have to last according to the customer expectation. So we're talking about quality. We need to have both of those delivered simultaneously in an integrated way, and we have to design it into our products, our services, and our processes. And when we start thinking about product, service, and processes, then we have to operationalize this definition for what does it mean for this actual product? What does this mean for this actual experience in a service? Or what does this mean for the actual activities that we pursue in a process? So we start thinking about stimulating this idea of successful quality 4.0. And so quality 4.0 is really this digitization of quality systems that we are developing for this new age. And we start seeing that there are many changes because of the way information is made available, the insights we can get from this. And we start seeing is there's really two equal parts we have to think about. One is dedicated people. That means designing end-to-end -end productive systems so they maximize value and then they also minimize loss. We also have to develop increased human capability. So the competence in people, do they have the capability to build countermeasures to process risk and make those known so that we can more rapidly turn around these detected excursions from expectations. Second is we have to have an assimilation of emergency technologies. And that means we have to accept some of these technological applications. And perhaps we have to adapt our ways of thinking to them and change our methods and tools because the technologies are making obsolete some of the things we used to do. I, I call this one, it's no longer our grandfather's quality. 
I, I recognize that our grandfathers in quality, uh, Ishikawa and these people, they never used even computers. So they were not, if you will, aware even of the capabilities that information technology could deliver. So we have to reset and think about digitalization differently. So we have to understand the contributions of new systems and automated production systems and how they can change the daily work we do in businesses. And when we move beyond quality 4.0, that's not the final resting place for where quality is going. So that's in a micro quality world. It's what we do inside the four walls of the factory. But what about macro quality? This is the enablers of, of responsibility of a corporation beyond the boundaries of one firm. And so we're merging quality concepts with the broadest application of sustainable technologies for the world, for society. And we start seeing emerging disciplines of macro quality where we're going to talk about quality of life for all of humanity. That includes social justice issues. And it also includes sustainability of the planet's environment and the biosphere. So quality by any other name. It must no longer be a hodgepodge of competing initiatives and actions. It must seek goodness and prevent badness for all of humanity and for product Earth. So we have to leave the details to do, be defined within industries, markets, and technologies. But somehow, under this umbrella of global quality, macro quality, we need to be able to bring all of that together. So takeaways. So hopefully in this session, you've discovered how 1987 became a breakthrough year in the evolution of modern quality. You've understood how some leading companies had periods of performance where for a decade or so, they influenced their quality development through executive-led actions. And thirdly, you've learned how a customer approach and enabling technology can advance quality thinking into quality 4.0 and beyond. So thank you very much. And right now, I'd like to turn it over to the moderator, and, and let's have some time for questions and answers.